Right, I'm Yaron Matras, and I lead the uh, Multilingual Communities Strand. And uh, rather than present you with an inventory or an extended inventory of planned activities on the Strand, I'd like you to uh, say a few words about the vision that guides the Multilingual Strand in particular, and perhaps also other aspects of the consortium. Last week, I went with two of my colleagues to a meeting at Greater Manchester Police Headquarters. And we met with a team of uh, managers and senior officers who want to improve the police force's communications with Manchester's diverse population groups. And they're interested in a whole range of questions which they would like us to address in uh, training sessions for police staff and uh, also to explore in greater detail through collaborative research projects. They want to know, for example, which languages are spoken in Manchester, Greater Manchester, and where. And they want to gain a better understanding of what is the difference between languages and dialects. They want to know which languages are what they call rare languages, and with that they mean languages um, where that are more difficult to find an interpreter for, or languages that lack conventionalized systems for reading and writing, or even just literacy opportunities. They want to know more about uh, which languages or which speakers of which languages are likely to be bilingual and in which other languages, and uh, which languages might lack terms such as domestic violence or hate crime, and how to convey such concepts to speakers of such languages. They also want advice on how emergency call handlers might be able to identify the language of a caller who doesn't know English so that they can get the right interpreter. And they're also interested in the dynamics of three-way interactions, so interactions that involve call handlers or officers, victims of crime, um, and uh, perhaps suspects as well, um, and interpreters. So what are the particular risks of such interactions? and what are possible techniques to, to manage them more effectively. So the questions that they ask fall under various different research headings, all of which are somehow connected to research and the study of modern languages. For example, language documentation, dialectology, social linguistics, bilingualism, um, second language acquisition, literacy, translation and interpreting, translanguaging, discourse and conversation analysis, and more. So all of this expertise in a whole variety of specialized domains is required by a key public service provider in order to effectively engage with its clients in the global city of today. And this is a city where the overwhelming majority of the population speaks what last week the Prime Minister referred to as the language of the world. So, Few people with responsibility for frontline services, I think, will deny that knowledge about language and or languages and access to a pool of people with knowledge of languages is essential in order to run a major city these days. And, and few people in the frontline services and uh, businesses, I think, will deny that such knowledge is also needed in order to effectively reach out to the world. And yet, denial is, is abundant, it seems, in the public and, and political discourse. The, the Prime Minister's statement last week, claiming that we will succeed in opening up to the world because our language is the language of the world, conceals the fact that effective global outreach actually means knowing more, not less, about the people that are your target audience, about your partners, and about your, your counterparts. And I believe this distortion is it, it's not a coincidence. Uh, the Brexit debate has been littered with linguaphobic remarks from Leave campaigners. Just days before the referendum, Ian Duncan Smith admitted in an interview with BBC's Michelle Hussein that there was actually no real economic issue around immigration, nor were migrants a real burden on services, but that the real issue was, according to him, that many British people felt uncomfortable living next door to people whose first language is not English and that such feelings should be taken into consideration, as he said. 
Um, now, this is not new. In 2012, the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government at the time, Eric Pickles, called on local authorities to stop translating documents into other languages because translation, he said, undermined community cohesion and encouraged segregation. Um, and Nigel Farage said um, a couple years before the referendum already, uh, one of the most outrageous perhaps fallacies, the claim that there were entire areas in our cities where nobody speaks English. So when the AHRC called for, and I quote, a new and exciting vision for languages research in response to the challenges and opportunities presented by a globalized research environment and a multilingual world, world we uh, responded to that challenge. And we responded not just out of greed for grants and appetite for box ticking exercises, but driven by genuine passion and, and commitment and by a belief that we have an opportunity here, as well as a duty, to change societal attitudes, to engage people, to motivate them, to embrace a multilingual reality. Driven by a conviction that the challenges and opportunities of a multilingual world are, are just that, the reality of the world around us, and not just the, the quirky and indulgent um, privileges of, of the ivory tower. At a time when universities are downscaling their language degree programs, part of that challenge surely must be to help higher education institutions to adjust the delivery of their language research and language teaching and to adapt it to the real needs of society, to provide the answers that are needed to leadership teams, such as the one that includes the performance manager at Greater Manchester Police or the patient experience manager at an NHS trust, to support the careers of others who deal with the multilingual world and local multilingual community, whether it's the curator of Manchester Art Gallery, the EAL coordinator at Abraham Moss High School or the recruitment managers and marketing consultants in companies like Siemens, AstraZeneca or KPSG. How do we change societal attitudes to languages? How do we get people with public and political profile to abandon a monolingual mindset and to recognize a multilingual reality? How do we channel our knowledge and expertise in languages in such a way that would make it a value adder for graduates whom we expect to take on leadership positions in the private and the voluntary and the public sectors? And how do we shape our teaching, our learning through research, our investment in socially responsible, employable graduates, and the social impact or societal impact and visibility of our research to address these uh, demands? Well, the consortium's multilingual community strand is anchored in the University of Manchester's Multilingual Manchester Strategic Initiative. We set this up in 2010 um, with the aim of giving the study of modern languages in Manchester a unique character, one that would be intrinsically intertwined with public engagement and outreach to the local community, an activity to which both students and researchers would contribute and over which they would both be in a position to claim ownership. Since then, Multilingual Manchester has become uh, not just a local, but a bit of a worldwide recognized brand, kind of a model of a different kind where research not only inspires teaching and leads to impact, but where learning and public engagement open up new opportunities and new avenues for research. Where non-academic partners are not just audiences, but active stakeholders who help shape and inspire our research, and not least where an internal seed coin investment in social responsibility activities can bring a tenfold return in the form of an external award for research. So I'd like to introduce to you some of the activities of Multilingual Manchester, just do a short um, tour of the Multilingual Manchester website. We began in 2010 really around an oversubscribed undergraduate course unit on societal multilingualism, where students were encouraged to carry out projects in the community to go out to Manchester and describe multilingual practices. They wrote up their reports as part of their coursework. Um, and these reports were then put online and archived. And they are still there. We have them in regular batches every year. Um, they appear um, formatted. Uh, the students are named as authors. They can be cited. They can put it on their CVs. Uh, we can showcase the way that we organize 
coursework for prospective students. And of course, the information is available and accessible, and we've had over the years many queries have come to us and also many ideas for further research that have inspired us to carry out specialized research, some of it co-produced -co research um, as well. Um, we have in the past few years uh, collected now over well over 150 reports um, in the archive, authored altogether by more than 500 persons, making this the world's largest online research resource on multilingual practices in any single urban community, as well as the world's largest online research resource authored entirely by undergraduate students. In 2012, we set up the Multilingual Manchester Volunteer Scheme, at the time, the very first school-based student volunteer scheme. And every year, we have around 300 students who sign up to the scheme and um, participate in different activities that involve engaging with the city's diverse population, for example, through host institutions such as local hospitals, uh, providing English language support, delivering English conversation sessions. We've now started an activity with Manchester's Syrian community um, and give support to an interactive exhibition uh, that goes around in schools and museums and um, other institutions um, uh, as well. Earlier this year, we launched LinguaSnap. LinguaSnap is the University of Manchester's very first teaching and research app. It is also the world's first mobile app designed to collect and analyze images of what we call linguistic landscapes, or multilingual signs. You can take a picture on your phone. This is open to the public. Add various analytical descriptors uh, about the sign, the outlets, um, the semiotics of the sign, and send the image with the descriptors to a database which connects to an online map of Manchester, which can be um, browsed and you can sort, for example, by language, um, update the search, and it'll give you those outlets that have signs in, in this case, Bengali. And you can see a certain concentration there in an area in Manchester, and you can click on the icon and uh, view the image uh, in Bengali here, and you can also see the information. How can you see the info? Where do you see the information? Um, well, you can uh, oops. see the information about the sign that's been collected and go into Street View and actually see the sign in its uh, original location. So in the past few months since we released the app, um, through work by students as well as members of the public. We've collected now over um, a thousand images and we're in the process of uh, analyzing them. So it's a form of, of crowdsourcing uh, research and crowdsourcing data uh, for research. And we're also in the process of, of uh, exporting the concept. Um, just last week we launched LinguaSnap Jerusalem and there are uh, several other cities across five, six continents, I guess. Hawaii is not a continent, so several continents, um, waiting, uh, actually queuing up now to uh, launch their own version of, uh, of LinguaSnap. Some of our research uh, has been co-produced with various partners and services in Manchester, and again, just last week, we launched a uh, report um, on research carried out together with the NHS on language provisions and access to primary and hospital care in central Manchester. Um, it contains various recommendations, and we are uh, looking forward in the next few weeks to um, discussing some of these recommendations with the NSH, NHS uh, clinical commissioning groups um, here in the Manchester area. And uh, finally, uh, some of our outputs involve um, visual documentation. These were all made uh, exclusively by, by students. And they include uh, films such as um, parents discussing bilingualism in the home, um, practitioners, speech and language therapists discussing the benefits of bilingualism, as well as documentation of various events and activities that we've um, carried out. And um, before I finish, I'd like to uh, share with you a, a short film that was produced by two MA students at the Granada Center for Visual Anthropology, which is one of the institutes that is um, involved in the consortium. 
And the film documents the Levensium Language Day, which we organized a year ago in one of Manchester's inner city neighborhoods. Uh, it actually shows just how much enthusiasm there is among people, families, organizations to um, get together and celebrate language diversity. It shows how language diversity brings people together rather than tear them apart. Um, it also shows what contribution higher education institutions can, can make to raise awareness of languages and to broker relations between stakeholders in the community around the theme of languages and to draw on our academic and our research capacity to influence societal attitudes in respect of languages. As a film, it shows, of course, the contribution that visual documentation can have to our work, and it shows, of course, the wonderful creative potential that lies with our students at the Granada Center to, to do just that. So, brief look at the film. <laughs> Uh, today is a multilingual day. This stall is for Manchester Deaf Centre. So our aim is to raise awareness for BFL but it's a recognisable language. It's, it's just to teach BSL and, and introductory signs to people. So for example, hello, thank you, how are you, where are you from, what is your name, just simple things. Um, view of what you know, a language can offer through the language, so the, the dance, it's the food, as well as the interaction. People are, are very open towards one another. Stacey, what's your favorite part of the day here of the language day? Uh, we get to hear songs. <laughs> Cesar um, Hijra, that, that's the name of our the Hijra school, Arabic school. We're teaching the kids Arabic, um, doing Hinata too as well in Arabic, um, as well as um, getting them to practice um, Arabic calligraphy, writing the names in Arabic calligraphy, and all sorts of other activities. <laughs> Everybody is coming together with, from different backgrounds and seeing how everybody is dancing. And the best part, which and I like, is that you can actually test the languages and speak a different languages and different words. In Polish language, when there is S and Z, we pronounce it as sh. Sh. Sh.
bit of salsa, I watched some salsa. I got my name written in Mandarin. Um, I've just come over to Inspire and I've started learning a little bit of Mandarin. I hope it goes on again next year. Um, I definitely come along a, a bit earlier. Even if it's on a Saturday, I'll wake up for it next year. The HSC has invited us to come up with a vision. I'd like to outline some principles of that vision. We need to remove the fear of languages from our society and from our public discourse. Without that, we're fighting a lost battle for any reform of language curricula and for any expansion of modern languages in any institution. There are those who require our expertise in order to rise to the everyday practical challenges that they face when working in a linguistically diverse and global environment, and we need to engage with them. We need to show how being able to draw on background knowledge of languages is relevant to managerial and leadership positions, both those that deal with local populations and those that reach out more globally. We need to work with communities and give them pride in their language heritage, support them with the skills to maintain that heritage. We need to show that the study of language is not at all old fashioned, that it can be, that it is and it can continue to be at the forefront of technological innovation and of innovative techniques of learning through research, of public outreach, visibility and high impact. We need to include all of these elements into a redesigned, reconfigurated curriculum for languages and we need to rethink the way we deliver language degrees. We need to break away from the framing of languages along nation-state boundaries, which continues to shape the way in which we organize language degrees. And we need to move instead to a comparative and a global perspective, one that reaches out to the local community and its everyday practices at least as much as it is preoccupied with traditional cultural assets. So in the coming four years, we will do our very best to allow Multilingual Manchester to make use of this wonderful new opportunity to seek inspiration from the consortium's many academic and non-academic partners and from the OWRI scheme, the OWRI program more generally. And uh, hopefully we will also be fortunate enough to see others um, seeking some inspiration from us. Thank you very much.